Chapter 10 of our books starts beginning looking at a new topic. We're going to start examining controls and think about how different controls are being put in place in order to make sure our systems work properly and that they're not being abused. So this chapter introduces some basic control concepts and talks about why it's so important. And we're going to also hit the major control environment elements inside of a company. The chapter does get into some of the specific frameworks like COBIT and COSO and ERM, but I don't feel like that's going to be the focus for this particular class. It's possible other courses will have a little more time to develop it, these concepts. But at the moment, we're going to keep it somewhat framework abstract and look at the high-level concepts that we need to work on. We're also going to talk about risk a little bit. And risk is an interesting concept. It's about trying to figure out how to design policies to make sure that the proper things happen in an organization. So we're going to discuss some kind of foundational concepts there. So first off, you know, why are controls needed? Like, what's the goal here? Well, if you think about a small business, you often have the owner-operator doing everything. If an owner-operator is doing all the tasks in the business, there's not much need for control because they're doing everything. However, once that person starts hiring other workers and maybe even hiring managers and putting people underneath managers, now we have a different situation. Our owner now needs to, make sh needs to be able to make sure that things are actually happening, whether that be inventory being ordered, whether that be uh, just you know, performance reviews or evaluations. They also need to make sure that people aren't taking advantage of systems or stealing things. And so you have to figure out a way to design people's roles to encourage this right kind of behavior to happen. And we talk about these sort of risks to an organization as some kind of threat, some kind of unwanted event. It could be someone stealing something, it could be a computer crashing, it could even be a hurricane or an earthquake. And we'll also talk about the, the impact of a threat. If something happens, what's the outcome of that item? So if a clerk steals money from a till, we're talking about a fairly low impact. You know, it's bad, we don't want that to happen, but it's not going to destroy the company. On an alternative, imagine an earthquake or a hurricane hits our main headquarters and all the backups and all the financials for the whole company are held in that one building. That's pretty catastrophic. And so these different, different events will have different impacts we also think about likelihood. What's the probability a certain event will happen? So when I lived in California, uh, earthquakes are pretty common, so a very high likelihood. But here in West Virginia, it's much less likely and not very common. So we think about both the impact and the likelihood together to decide how to respond to risks. So some risks we're not going to respond to. So in California, we would definitely want to have plans for an earthquake. Here in West Virginia, not that, not that much. So AIS, and AIS should help an organization operate well. So we're going to try and help design the system in a way to make sure we can achieve our goals. So this means a proactive approach. We're going to try and design stuff to make sure that things don't occur. Rather than just respond to bad things, we're going to try to make things not actually happen. And then once threats actually do occur, we want to correct and recover from them as well. We call this whole category of things internal controls. These are different processes we put in place to make sure that the right things happen. So we could have safeguarding assets as one example. And this could be, again, clerk and using a till, making sure that the right amount of money stays in there. So as an example, you, whenever people start their shift, you might make sure they count the cash in the till and reconcile it with whatever is supposed to be in there. We need to have sufficient records. If we sell something, buy something, hire someone, we should know all that information. We need to make sure the data is correct. It's surprisingly easy to collect inaccurate information in an organization because people often are motivated to make sure it's really good. But if you're the manager or CEO, you want to know that the data coming into you is actually what's happening in the real world. We need to create financial reports that align with GAAP. We want to be efficient. We don't want people to waste time. We don't want you know, manual data entry. We want to make sure that things are working smoothly. We want to make sure that policies are being followed and that we're aligning with all laws and regulations. So there's a bunch of different goals that internal controls are all supposed to deal with. We can split them into two, or sorry, into three general categories of controls. Preventative, detective, and corrective. So preventative says we want to stop things from occurring. So as an example of this kind of control, you might say we have regular backups of our, of our uh, data. You could say that we have you know, policies for new hardware to be purchased regularly. 
Or you could say you have uh, dual disks on servers. Right? There's three different kinds of controls that all relate to not losing your data. Well, things that keep data from being lost to begin with, like regularly get rid of old hard drives and replace them with new hard drives, would be preventative. We're trying to not keep these things from even happening. Detective are things where we discover. So maybe our backup software automatically scans to see if there's any corruption in our software. Well, if we don't know that corruption is happening, we're just going to back up and we're not going to realize that we have a problem. So we need controls that will detect things. Then we have corrective. How do we keep stuff once we know it's bad and maintain what we want in our business? So how do you respond to problems? How do you, so this could be the backup software then if it notices we've lost something, it'll copy data out of the backup onto the live system. Now there's a whole bunch of legislation around this. Uh, this class is not gonna go into detail on these. You'll probably see these more in other classes. The big one you'll probably hear talked about a lot is SOX, Starbanks Oxley which applies to publicly held companies. And so there's a lot of regulations here on trying to make sure that public companies do what they should. There's a couple of different control frameworks you'll see in more upper level courses here in the program, as well as for the CPA review and exam. But again, we're not gonna cover those in detail in this particular class. There are five components that are, I think are actually useful to know though. So these ones, if you take the Becker prep course, uh, you'll see them referred to as Becker's crime acronym. So Becker is one of the prep study tools for the CPA exam. We can split it into five different categories, control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information communication, and monitoring. And basically these are sort of trying to give you ways of thinking through the whole system and seeing if the entire system of a company supports our, our control environment. So let's go through each one. The first one is going to be the control environment. The control environment lets us look at management's overarching philosophy and attitude. Now, if you go to different companies, you'll probably see very different ways of running a business. Some businesses are very, very aggressive and sales oriented. Some are very cautious and very safe. So imagine going to EY or a big four and then comparing that to the environment of a state auditor's office you'll find a very different attitude about getting business, about how to deal with contracts, about time expectations, all that kind of thing. So the control environment says that the control environment has to be set up in a way that encourages ethical behavior. And that means like valuing risk management. That means valuing integrity. That means internal oversight by the board of directors. It means an org chart. It means a ways of giving authority and responsibility in a strong HR department. These are all things that sort of act as a preventative control if you don't have a positive environment here, then you encourage people to cut corners and not follow policies. Let me look at risk. We can look at risk in two different ways, likelihood and impact. So likelihood is probability, it will occur, and the impact is potential loss. Generally what we'll do is we'll use EVA to sort of connect these two together. So as an example, imagine I have a likelihood, a one in 10 chance that a negative event is gonna happen and the impact of it is gonna be $1 million. Well, if I'm trying to compare how much money is spent on different threats, I might compare that to one where you have like a one in two chance of occurring, but it only has a $10,000 potential loss. Well, the $10,000 potential loss is only about 5K. In other words, you times half by $10,000, whereas the million dollar loss is a thousand, I'm sorry, $100,000. So we would then prioritize this one, even though it's less likely to occur, the severity is so much higher that it's still worth us putting more effort into stopping. We can also think about risk as the types of risk and how to handle it. Some kinds of risk are just inherent. There's just no way to remove the risk and still have that activity maintain its essential character. As an example, like to mountain bike. So mountain biking, you're out on trails, you're going over tree roots, you're going over you know, berms and things, and there's really no way to make that a completely safe activity. It always has an element of inherent risk to it that if you take away all of that risk, you're basically riding a fixed cycle inside of an office building room, and it doesn't have the same character. So that's an essential part of it. Now I can control some of the risk though. So on a mountain bike, when I bike out there, I've got a helmet on, I wear gloves, I bike within my capabilities, I don't go faster than I can control the bike. So there are certain things I can do to minimize risk, but there is still residual risk left over. 
And you need to talk to a mountain biker, you'll inevitably talk to someone who's crashed or someone who has friends who've broken bones and things like that. Because there is risk, even if you try to minimize that risk. So this is residual. Any risk that's left over after you try to control. So how do we respond to risks? Well, first thing is reduce it. So when I go mountain biking, I wear a helmet that reduces the risks. I might just say I accept it. I say, you know what, it's fun to jump stuff. So even though it's probably better not to, I'm still going to do it because I want to have fun. We can share the risk. You know, I have insurance so that if I get hurt, I can go to a hospital and get stitched up. Uh, you could avoid it, right? So there's certain risks that I think are too extreme. So when I go to a bike park, I don't go down the double diamond trails because that's just too much risk for me. I don't want to engage in that. So this is the same thing for a business, right? How do you respond to risk? Well, you do your best to reduce it, but you have to accept that all activities are essentially risky to some level. And if you want to have a business, you've got to do risky stuff. But you try to mitigate it by sharing the risk and avoiding things that are too significant. So what are some activities we can do now? What are some things we do with controls to help this stuff happen properly? Well, one thing we're going to look at is segregation of duties and authorization. We want to make sure there's an environment set up where there's oversight of people's activities. And we'll talk about that more in a second here. We're also going to have controls over projects and acquisition of software. We're going to have controls over change. We're going to have controls over how we use documents and records. And we're trying to keep all of our stuff safe, whether it be a physical asset, a digital record, or cash somewhere. We want to make sure that that stuff doesn't get lost. And a big part of this is independent checks on performance. The idea is that we want to have people whose job it is to come in and just make sure things are going well. And the reality is, if you have a job, you tend to focus on the high value activities, the things that seem to require a lot of attention and focus. And it's real easy to let certain things slide that you don't feel are that important. But even though you might feel they're not that important, it's possible that they actually are. So that's why you need someone to come in and make sure you're doing the job you're supposed to be working on. So let's talk about separation of duties. ARC, A-R-C, is authorization recording, and custodial. These are three different roles we want to split out. So let's start up each one. First, custodial. This is the easiest to understand. This is the people who actually have stuff. So as an example, a clerk. A clerk has cash, and they put cash into a safe or put cash into a register. So this is stuff that anything around actually having something. Well, you want to split that up from recording. So think about checking out at Kroger's or any other rest or grocery store you'll see that even though the, the person at the till has the cash, we try to have people actually record things using the point of sale terminal. And the idea is that if they're being recorded on the point of sale terminal, it's less likely for the person to be able to manipulate or change those elements. So you want to split these details off. So this could be source documents, it could be journals, reconciliations, all kinds of ways to check the recording thing and keep it separate. If you think back to our revenue cycle, there's the remittance process where people send us checks. And part of that process of opening up those envelopes is having two people there, one who has the custodial function and one who has the recording function. So the remittance goes to recording and the check goes to custodial. And those two are two separate departments. Lastly, we have authorization. Authorization is the idea that someone should have to sign the check or finally approve an item. And that should be a different person than those who have the cash or those that record the activity. This could be something as simple as whenever someone writes a check for a business, you have a person writing the check and then it goes to the CFO for their signature. And that CFO has the final authorization. Now, in all of these things, um, in small businesses, you're going to find these, these things are broken regularly. It's really impossible in a small business to have truly effective controls because the same people are doing all the different functions. But as organizations get bigger, you can do more splitting up and more work in this area. We can even do ARC and segregation over systems duties. So we might have splitting out tasks for data entry versus programming. Right? You don't want the same people putting data in that also program our code. We have those that keep the operations working and are not the same as that program it. People who are responsible for data are either separate, and then these things are trying to be split out from each other. And the more splitting that we do, the more likely it is we're going to catch issues before they occur. Then we have information and communication. So obviously with an AIS system, we're trying to obtain high quality information. So we make sure that we have the right records and that they are accurate. 
and then we can communicate them clearly to people inside and outside the organization. And monitoring. Monitoring basically means that I need to have ways for people to keep an eye on what's happening in my organization. So we do things like budgets, we track purchases, we do periodic audits. Uh, you often find in large organizations, you have a, people come in who are forensic specialists with fraud detection or fraud hotlines. Again, trying to catch problems before they become big. All right, we're going to talk about a couple of these problems in class, but hopefully this gives you a good overview of the chapter and some of the concepts we're playing with as we move into the third part of the course.